You're watching Oilers Nation every day with Tyler Uremchak. Your one-stop shop for all things Oilers. Welcome into Golden Knights Every Day. Let's get into it with the lead. Woo! This is going to get screenshotted and thrown around, so let's quickly bring in Liam while I take it off. Liam, what's going on? Worst lead we've ever done. I hated that so much, and I will hate it forever. And everybody in the chat, screenshot it and post it. Tyler's betrayed us all. Tyler's betrayed us all. I should have worn it. it backwards. It's the real deal. James Neal. Unbelievable. Not for me. Back up this in the shit closet. shit is goes. bananas. Yeah, I got you that mug. It's got a good mug. Um, unsubscribed. <laughs> People are unsubscribing. This is not good. <laughs> so uh, you, you can get your very own Vegas Golden Knights jersey at the Sports Closet. Find them online. Mm. Sportscloset.ca. Um, I literally just looked and saw it Don't right before the that. show started. Like it was eleven fifty eight, and I was like, "Oh, this is too funny. I gotta do it after yesterday." Um, Unbelievable. <laughs> welcome into Oilers Nation every day, uh, live from the Sports Closet Studio, live on the Oilers Nation YouTube as well. Listen, I'm a content man. You guys are getting the comments going now. It's good for the algorithm. I regret. Absolutely nothing. Um, welcome into the show. It is finally a Sherwood Ford Giant Game Day edition of the show. Uh, you know what? I just I want to get to some of these comments <laughs> in, like in the Charm Diamond Center's YouTube chat. Uh, Davin says shame. Jake says feels like Joe's haven't played in forever. He did say that that Golden Knighters you would make good toilet paper. That's why mm-hmm. I keep it around actually. Um, Jack Campbell, why is the show from home today? Wanted the boys to touch feet because it's Wednesday, Jack. It's Wednesday, Jack. We're going to talk about Jack Campbell in a little bit. Uh, Fight on site. Don't turn that into an ad. Colton unsubscribed. Mm -hmm. Longer suspension than Petro got. Sure. (laughs) Brian said, unlike. Not great. Austin said, my favorite time of the day besides waking up with the wife with a winky face. That seems unnecessarily (laughs) horny for 12 o'clock on a Wednesday. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, Tech G, $40 jersey, good for burning. Hey, listen, I saw it, and it was 40 bucks at a flea market, and it had James Neal on the back, and I was like, that's kind of cool. James Neal was an oiler at the time, so I decided to get it and add it to my collection. I have a lot of jerseys, and a lot of them I do regret buying. That would probably be one of them. I'd probably rather have the $40 re- last night. Um, Dave is in, making this very serious. It's clearly a joke. Tyler did not get enough attention as a child. Any attention is good attention. Uh, Dave, when you're in the content game, that could not be any more true. Uh, anyways, that was a fun way to start the show. Was it? It was an interesting way to start the show, but we got a game to talk about, Tyler. We actually have a game to discuss yep. today. We so do. It's a Sherwood it. Ford Giant Game Day edition of the show. The Oilers begin a homestand here, Liam, and a nice chance mm-hmm. for them to maybe turn on the Jets and start to go on a little bit of a run here as you take a peek. Washington. Colorado, Buffalo, Montreal, and then Buffalo. Four games, three against non-playoff opponents as well. Man, this is a good opportunity for the Oilers. Yeah, it's a it's a great opportunity for them to kind of keep climbing and increase that gap between themselves and the LA Kings and the Vegas Golden Knights. And some very winnable games there. That Buffalo one is uh, is one they're going to want to win. I think after what happened to them the other day, they played very poorly. Montreal, obviously, they've beaten so far this season. And yeah. McKinnon and McDavid, again, a lot of comparisons this season. So we'll see how McDavid comes out in that one. He even spoke about him on the bench the other day, which was interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting little mic'd up moment from Connor McDavid. Uh, second time playing Washington this year for the Oilers. Last time, it was a shutout victory for them back in November. A win that really kind of, in the moment, was a big win. Because it was the first of the eight-game heater, I believe. I honestly just do not remember that game at all. I I didn't realize they had played each other, but I went and looked back, and McDavid had four four assists on the night. Drysaddle, I yep. think, had two goals and an assist. So hopefully it, we get something was, similar tonight. It was the first of the four of the uh, eight game heater for the Edmonton Oilers. Gotcha. So it was a win that you could argue kind of turned their season mm. around uh, in a way. And Edmonton now, like I said, looking to go on a bit of a run 8 p.m puck drop tonight or it's a tnt broadcast in the states so nationally televised down south that usually means the puck doesn't drop until 8 20 which is just 
yeah. insanity for a game with Connor McDavid and Alex Ovechkin to start at 10 20 Eastern time is in it's ridiculous. One, one of the final games between uh, uh, McDavid and one of the greats to ever play in Alexander Ovechkin too. One of the final times he'll be in Edmonton yeah. as a man who's trying to chase Alexander, uh, Alexander Ovechkin's record, Wayne Gretzky's record for all time goals. So yeah, it's just, it's just a bizarre thing to do. And, it's expected, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, what the NHL does. Lance is in 820 blaze it. Hell yeah, brother. <laughs> it, to be fair, if you're doubling it, shouldn't it be eight? Uh, whatever, we don't need to get into it. Um, Washington has won six of their last 10, Liam. So to really get set for this game, let's get into our game notes for this evening. Put it a little earlier on in the show because I want to sink our teeth into this Washington Capitals matchup a bit. Worth noting, 12.30, Steve Wino from the Associated Press is going to swing by. Wino, I love Wino. He's one of my favorite media people in the NHL. Whenever I do drafts and free agency and stuff, my like two or three run-ins with Steven Wino are always some of my favorite moments. But Wino's going to come by. He's based out of Washington, so he's going to chat with us about the Caps a bit. But this is a Caps team that, as you pointed out, Liam, six wins in their last 10 games. But I want to go into those 10 games a little bit more with our game notes. They've been outshot in every single game, every single game of that 10 game streak. They've won six of them because Charlie Lindgren has actually been pretty good. 907 save percentage in those games. They're outscoring teams on average 3.9 to three. So again, it's been close wins for the most part, but their power plays third in the league in that span. Their PK is ninth in the league in that span. This is a team that's riding kind of their special teams right now to to overcome to overcome their lackluster play at five on five, I'll call it. Yeah, it, it kind of seems that way, isn't it? And this Washington team is is interesting. I thought they'd be a little worse than they are this season, to be honest, but kind of close still in that playoff race. And the Oilers penalty kill will have to show up today, I, I guess you could say, to, to help them get over the line and, and get through. But I think ultimately, when you go back and look through that last 10 games or so from Washington, they had a, a good game against Florida with uh, going to overtime and losing. But like, they're kind of just being bad teams at the end of the day. So being at home for Edmonton, like I don't know if I'm expecting a 5 nothing game like we saw earlier in the season. But I think the Oilers should be able to handle uh, the Capitals quite easily. And after what uh, Vetchkin said yesterday, was it when he was saying, "What do you think of uh, Chris Allen McDavid being separate lines?" He's like, "What's his name?" We've got uh, Connor McMichael and Hendrix Lapierre, as Tyler called me out on yesterday. I've been practicing that one. I might have might have bucked it still though. No, you nailed it. Hendrix Lapierre. Yes. I know my mic is apparently acting up. Is it acting up? You? I just switched off to I a th- different one right now. I thought you were completely fine. I, I heard people say that. People were saying you were choppy and the mic was off, but you looked completely fine to me. Now Aaron, you're off the mic. Our, check our connection, Aaron. Let's see if uh, this is working. Mic is off. Um, all right. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get that sorted out on the fly, but we'll keep cruising through the show. There you go. I think I'm on the right mic now. Oh, well. There we you go. Never... Yeah, you sound good. Let's do it. I sound Let's keep good? chopping. Yeah. Okay. It might be the broadcast, actually. People are saying there's, like, crackling. Oh. This always happens well, when we do the show from home, but I'm not giving up my work from home day. You you cannot pry that away from me. <laughs> uh, anyways, the Capitals, again, playing decent hockey, but it's been largely an up-and-down season for them. I mentioned the special teams thing. That is really fueling them right now. And another thing that is really, really going to help is the fact that they're getting some bodies back from the IR potentially. Jason Greger sent out a tweet earlier today. It sounds like the Capitals could be getting back all three of Tom Wilson, Nick Dowd, and Martin Derevy into their lineup. That is a massive, massive boost for a Capitals team that, again, they're kind of just hanging around in the edges of the playoff race right now. They probably need to get going and win. I don't know, eight out of 10 for a cup for a stretch here. If they really want to put themselves firmly back in the mix, but Hey, if you're a caps fan and, and you're looking for optimism, if you win your games in hand, you're jumping Detroit and you're one back of the New York Islanders. That's legit. Well, how about that? Uh, that fight today in the Detroit Red Wings practice. Did you see that? 
Yeah, ben, I mean they're they're spiraling right now. Yeah, Ben Sherrod and, and Lucas Raymond go out. Aaron, sorry, if you could pull that back up at Eastern Conference wildcard race there. It is a it's a tight one. A win tonight would go a long way, like you said, and even just ahead of a Tampa Bay as well as uh, the Philadelphia Flyers and the Metro hanging on the same division as Washington there. So things are things are tight there in the, in the Eastern Conference. Now, yesterday we kind of had a bit of a debate while the playoff race is in, in the West, but over in the East, like, it's night and day. It's like, what was that? Probably down to, uh, it's probably Washington is the cutoff, right? So like, the team's actually in the race, but they're going to come out tonight and they're going to really need that win to keep themselves going. Yeah. Um, okay, we're trying to work on things here. I actually don't know what the YouTube says. We're getting like full bars on our connection. So uh, we're going to keep grinding away to try to fix our uh, our little internet connection issue. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Uh-huh. Lance says, I'll, I only leave when Colby is on. I will watch through the audio. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck issue is here. Jesus Christ. Um, okay, let's continue along here, Liam. I wanted to get to a thing uh, the, that NHL Edge had their fascinating graphic from the NHL stats department, and it was basically the league leaders in goals from different areas of the ice, and they broke it up into like 10 to 12 different quadrants here. But it is so funny to see every other leader be like seven, eight, nine, and then Zach Hyman scoring 31 goals from right in front of the net. That is insane, man. The fact that, again, like we're not talking like 31 and there's a couple other guys in certain areas who are at like 20 or 25, 31. And then the next leader in an area is nine. Nobody dominates one area better than Zach Hyman dominates the front of the net. It, it is wild. I really should have locked up and see who number two would be in that area. But yeah, you got all these guys who are, no one else touches 10, right? No doubt. You and uh, is that Jack Hughes? Oh, Aho would be the closest. So yeah, that's kind of funny. But yeah, Zach Hyman, 32 goals. He's just a uh, 31. Sorry, just an absolute. We'll call him a sniper from that position. A natural finisher, as, as I've been debating all season from from that spot but we've seen the map right the goal map and then the only goal outside of that area is i should call it jacob badad docker's office was a, an empty netter yeah and shout out to brock besser who scored two goals from the neutral zone so far this season i think <laughs> one of them came against the edmonton oilers as well in the second game of the year but don't quote me on that uh apparently we have fixed the audio liam what did we do mm. nothing nothing <laughs> it was a YouTube thing. I just went and listened on Twitter and Facebook. It sounded completely fine, but on YouTube, it was kind of laggy a little bit. So apologies. Thank you for everyone staying. Ryder said he left, which is unfortunate, but hopefully everyone else is, is stuck around and we will power through. But I also, I know we're kind of mowing along here, Tyler, but I went back yesterday for some reason and listened to the first like 30, 40 seconds of our first ever episode. And it is awesome. If you want audio issues, Go listen to that podcast because one of us, it was me, left the actual YouTube show oh, yeah. on the laptop whilst we were doing it, and it just played for the first like fifteen seconds. So no, I think it was me because I was, was running it, it through. Yeah, I was running it through the audio mixer twice, and I was like, "Holy crap!" Um. Anyways, That's yeah, cool. we sorted it out. Like ugh, whatever. If you want the inside on like the way this stuff works, sometimes. I'm looking at our stream report on YouTube. If you say that's the only one where it sounds bad, um, it literally the only notes it gives us: stream is healthy, twelve fourteen, twelve oh nine. Stream is excellent. So it just kind of worked itself out. That's the way things kind of go when you broadcast uh, on the internet. Uh, let's keep cruising along with the show today. Let's get to the lineup report for our friends over at Service Credit Union, Liam. The Service Big Share Contest is back once again. It is your chance to get your hands on a $1 million <clears throat> grand prize. And you're thinking, Tyler, is it complicated? Is it hard for me to get in on this draw for a $1 million? Not at all. There's only one month less left, so don't let this chance pass you by. Anyone can enter. All you need to do is become a member and save with service. Every $500 saved gives you five entries into the service. Big share contest. Contest ends April 30th, 2024. Skill test required for rules. Visit service.ca slash win. For the Edmonton Oilers, Liam, it is going to be Stuart Skinner as the confirmed starter tonight. Expect him to go up against Charlie Lindgren in the crease. Lindgren has actually started nine of the last 10 
for the Washington Capitals. So Skinner, who has a shutout already this year against his Capitals team, gets the start. We discussed it over the last couple of days, but I like this decision, I think. At first, I was like, oh, ride the hot hand, Calvin Pickard coming off a shutout, but I think what's more important is keeping Skinner in a good routine. Yeah, I think Skinner should always be the priority between the pipes. It should never be... Oh, well, Picker played well last game. Stuart Skinner's your star, and it needs to be shown that way. I think at the start of the season, when there was the debate of like who should start game one, Campbell or Skinner, and mm-hmm. the New Orleans made a wrong decision in that department, granted a different coaching staff then, but your starting goalie should be the priority, and Skinner is that guy. Skinner's that guy, although he needs a bounce back game. I did not like his game against Buffalo at all. I, I think that's maybe a little harsh. I mean, he only gave up two goals. But his saves weren't that good. Like the two goals that went in, I think were very avoidable. He was giving up a lot of rebounds. He just didn't seem to be comfortable the whole time. I, I'm going to obviously forgive the shootout stuff. That was a weird situation overall. Ekholm said his pads were already on the ground when they got in the dressing room and got told to come out. But I don't know. He just didn't seem like himself. So a bit uncomfortable in there. Maybe it's because the game started at the crack of dawn. Yeah. Uh, Squishy says if Skinner shits the bed, he should sit for a while. I don't think so. I no, I even think if, even if Skinner has a bad game tonight, I think you're rolling him right back out there against the Colorado Avalanche on Saturday. When you have a big game like that, you go with your big dog, your number one. Skinner's this team's number one, and it makes sense that they're going to keep kind of treating him like it. So Skinner gets the start tonight against Washington. Charlie Lindgren on the other side. Uh, we'll continue with the lineup report, then I want to ask you a question. But uh, – it's going to be Sam Carrick drawing in for Derek Ryan. This makes sense. Listen, I don't think Sam Carrick is going to play every game from now until the end of the season or anything like that. I don't think Derek Ryan's going to sit for five straight games. I think this is about Chris Knobloch having a bit of a rotation, making sure everyone stays in a good amount of games and everyone can be relied on come playoff time. The last thing you want to do is get to like game three of the playoffs. You have an injury. You need to put Derek Ryan in and it's like, holy shit, he hasn't played in three weeks. Yeah, no, I I agree, and it kind of leads into another conversation, doesn't it? And we had it yesterday. Like, when are they going to get a stature in? Like, when's that going to happen? Because it's been three games now, maybe only two. I can't remember where he hasn't been able to play yet. So yeah. I'm curious when he's going to inject himself into the lineup. But yeah, I agree with you on Carrick and and Ryan, and I could see Perry and the Unmark rotating through too. I think those four guys are all capable of of sitting out for a game. Yeah. 100%. Uh, just on the blue line, I see we get we got some questions in about it from uh, Coles, one of the people that asked, when do you think Troy Stetcher will get into the lineup? Yeah. I honestly feel like it might. It shouldn't, but it might take an injury. That's probably a mistake. But like, again, if it was on merit, I think you could bring Cody Cece out of the lineup for a game now. I don't think they want to do that and create the headline. So I think it's either two things. Either Vinny DeHarnay has a very bad game at some point, or someone gets injured. I think those are the ways he gets in. I wonder I wonder if they would do it against Colorado on the weekend for mobility reasons. Stetcher, I think he's a better skater than both Vinny and CeCe. So I wonder if they would bring that in just to try and kind of match fire with fire a little bit. You know what I mean? That, that would seem like a logical spot, but again, I think it's inevitable Vinny's the one that comes out and CeCe just mm-hmm. gets the promotion no matter what. Yeah, and I I mean for right now as well. So he was acquired on the dead or the day before the deadline on Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had that Friday they didn't play, Saturday, Sunday they played, but I think he got in on Saturday or like right around then. So yeah. you give him a day to get acclimated. Like it maybe would have made sense to put him in second of back to backs, but it's like ah, you know, we didn't get a practice in or whatever. I don't know. Maybe tonight would have made sense. Maybe tonight would have been a good game to throw him into the mix because I do think uh I do think you want to give him a look and don't want to have him sitting for 10 days. And I think against Colorado, you want to play your best lineup and your best lineup yeah. is probably still with Vinny and CC in. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I was just trying to think of a bit of a spot that maybe it just comes around next week and before we could practice. Yep. Um, just a quick update here. I saw someone passed it along in the chat. Aiden Spencer Carberry confirms Darcy Kemper starts tonight against Edmonton. Rest of the lineup, TBD, several game time decisions. So Gregor mentioned it's possible Wilson, Faraby, and Dowd are in the lineup. Sounds like it's game time decisions. Darcy Kemper is actually going to be the starter. So my apologies on that. I did think it was going to be uh, Charlie Lindgren. 
but our boy Pat Puff on the graphics, you know he's got you covered. Here is the Skinner versus Kemper head-to-head. Kemper hasn't played that much this year. Charlie Lindgren is their starter. Charlie Lindgren's under contract next year. I want to throw you a scenario, Liam. Here we go. The Capitals are going into a rebuild. Mm -hmm. The Capitals clearly like Charlie Lindgren, or they would have cashed in and traded him at the deadline. How much would you add to do Kemper for Campbell this summer? Hmm. Contracts are very similar, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 5.25 for Kemper, 5 for Campbell. Let me pull up my cap friendly here before I give you an answer. Okay, so you got quite a few years. Bring the Red Deer boy home. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you would probably have to add a little bit, right? Maybe like a second or something like that. I want to add a first, but I don't know if I would want to add him at all. Is it not in the other's best interest just to move off that kind of money in general? But here's the thing. I don't think you can. I don't think there is a package of futures that the Oilers could realistically offer a team that will allow them to get Campbell off the books. The idea of Campbell for Kemper, I think, would be that you give a first round pickup and you bite the bullet and you're taking the chance on the better goalie. And Washington says, hey, all we need is a backup. We're going to be rebuilding for a couple of years. Why not? And and Jake says, I don't know if Washington would take Campbell for him. I'm talking about adding in futures to this thing, like not one for one. Washington would obviously never do it one for one. But if you wanted to build a good 1A, 1B duo, Kemper has a better chance of being that guy than Campbell. Can I can I float you a scenario? Sure. What if the Washington Capitals simply don't rebuild? They kind of don't 100% need to. They've got a young pieces in there, a lot, a lot of young pieces in their lineup. They're going to have Backstrom's money to play with in the summer. Like they could add to this lineup and get right back into the, the playoff picture more consistently, right? I know they're still kind of lingering in there. I don't fully expect them to make it, but yeah. they're passing expectations quite significantly, I would say, this season. We will uh, ask Stephen Wino about that. Mulek says the buyout isn't good on Kemper. Um, yeah, okay, fair. Yeah, and and hey, that's one thing about Campbell. The buyout actually isn't all that gross on Jack Campbell. Like, again, you hate to have that kind of money on the books, especially in years two and three of the buyout when it's $2.3 million, $2.6 million. I think you would rather just retain 50% of Campbell and get him out the door because then it's two point five for all three of those years. If you could retain 50% and have someone take Campbell for a mid-round pick, again, doubtful that someone would, but then you avoid yourself the, the nasty years. But again, with Stuart Skinner, who is under contract for two more years after this one, Liam, at a very nice cap hit, like flash that up again, Aaron. If you have Skinner at 2.9 or whatever, right? Okay, mm-hmm. next year, let's say you can go get a backup for 1.5, a good veteran backup. Do what the Rangers did going to get Jonathan Quick this year. Then the 1.1 of dead with the 2.9 for Skinner, that's four. 5.5 million on your backup once you factor in a one and a half million or 5.5 million on your goaltending once you factor in a one and a half million dollar backup. That's not that bad. And then the next year, if you run the same thing, it's 6.7 on your goaltending. And then it's the third year is where it would suck because that's where Campbell's cap it takes the biggest jump. And Stuart Skinner is going to need a new deal at that point. So that's where the concern would come, I guess. But I don't know. I, I still think most likely is that Campbell gets bought out. Uh, Calvin Pickard is in. I think Jack will be an Oiler next year, too, unfortunately. JT says, I think Campbell's better than Kemper. I strongly disagree with that. Lance says, just bring back Pickard. Sure. I, I mean... If he's gonna come in, if he's gonna come in for league minimum, why not? Luke says I think Campbell's gonna be back next year, but Liam, Jack Campbell is on a run right now, and I think it's I worth know. having a little bit of a conversation about it. Our boy Ryan Holt sent out the tweet that got a bunch of people talking, but Jack Campbell since November twenty first, so after he got a bit of a reset and they played Rodrigue for a string, fifteen eight zero. A 248 goals against average, a 926 save percentage, and two shutouts in that stretch for Jack Campbell. I saw Kevin Woodley, the goaltending analyst, was in Abbotsford watching Campbell's game for the Condors the other night. And he said Campbell's got some swagger back as well and looked a lot better in the crease. I don't know if you can bring him back now because of the cap implications, Mm -hmm. you know, the implications. Um, But ah. Playoff time? Do you, would you maybe trust him? Uh... Um, one quick thing, quickly. 
Noah, I see you in the chat, and I saw you left us a comment on Twitter, so we will address that later on because you went out of your way to remind us of the power tools. Thank but you. just on Campbell, I, I've thought about him being back next season. It avoids a bit of a headache of having a dead cap of, of him, Corey Perry, Conan Brown. You know, you, you might have like four million in cap along with uh, James Neal. So that increases it a little bit too. It's like, is it worth just seeing if this goes about it again? If he can finally get some rhythm, you finally get your duo of Skinner and Campbell that you kind of wanted. Worst case scenario, it doesn't work and you just have to bury him in the minors again. And it kind of is what it is, right? I wonder if they would run that risk of doing that because as we all know, Friendship goes a long way with the Edmonton Oilers. And the guys yep. like Jack Campbell. I I don't think it's a crazy idea that he would come back. In the playoffs, I 100% expect him to be with the team at some point. I think that's, As the third goalie. Yeah, third goalie. I would not be shocked at all if he ended up being on the bench for a game or two, whatever it may be. He's done so, well. To his credit, yeah. he has turned his entire season around in Bakersfield. They're winning a lot more games now. Like he, one of his first games, I think they won four one last night. One of his first games going down to Bakersfield was when they got shelled like six nothing or something like that. And he was the goalie and he was terrible mm -hmm. for him to do what he's done. I think that's actually a big credit to Campbell. And it's always been a, a bit of a, a mental game for him. Right. So if he's got that back, I'm, I'm curious to see, but again, like what if worst case scenario happens, he comes up and all of a sudden he's just shelled every game in the NHL again, because that's very possible too. Uh, I want to give a shout out to everyone who understood my It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia reference there that I made. I know you're not an It's Always Sunny mm -hmm. guy, Liam, but Aaron got it and a bunch of people in the chat did. So I was proud of myself on that one. Um, just one more thing on Campbell. So again, you talk about bringing him back. You bring him back, worst case scenario, you got to bury him again and it's $3.85 million of dead money on the books, right? Okay, whatever. You buy him out, you have all of a sudden for next year, when you have this Connor Brown overture, you've created yourself, the buyout saves you 3.9. So instead of 3.8 of dead money, you're saving yourself $3.9 million. Mm -hmm. You can go get a different backup goalie for relatively cheap. And that, that, that gap of money is significant. I just looked, if you were to wait another year to go and buy out Jack Campbell, it actually really doesn't save you all that much. All it would do is in the season after you buy them out, so two years from now, it's down to a $2.1 million cap hit, 2.4 the year after, and then two years of $1.35 million. So it saves you one extra year of dead money on the end of it, but you don't get that first season of big savings. And when you consider the Oilers cap picture for next year, you kind of need that savings, man, when you look at the Connor Brown overage. Yeah, and look, I, I'm not sitting here saying I, I want Campbell to be on this team. I just think it's going to be a, a major consideration for the Oilers of being like, can we just let him play rather than trying to buy someone out again and say, look, look we gave him another chance. And uh, someone, I think it was Naeem, our goalie expert in the chat, has made a point. He's like, two years in a row, he was not good. And there's a lot of evidence to prove it doesn't work too. So it's... It's an interesting one. It's one I'm surprised. I'm surprised we're talking about him again, to be honest, being in this position to even be capable of coming back to the NHL. But again, credit to him. He's he's done what he needed to do in Bakersfield to be involved in this conversation. Yeah. And I mean, I don't think there's, I, I don't see a scenario where Calvin Pickard is bad enough in consecutive starts where this Me is too. a change they consider making in season. Uh, let's cruise along. And you know what it's time for, Liam? It's time to get to the Star Mechanical guest line and bring in our pal Stephen Wino from the Associated Press. Star Mechanical, Edmonton's number one plumbing and heating company. It's been that way for north of 20 years. Find them online, starmechanical.ca. Plumbing, heating, HVAC services. They got it all. Speaking of having it all, Stephen Wino joins us to talk Washington Capitals Eastern Conference, but you're doing so from an ACC basketball tournament. You know me, and I was writing a football story on the Washington Commanders yesterday from a Ted Cruz hearing on college athletics. This is what I did. <laughs> uh, you're an absolute machine. Uh, let's talk a little hockey here. This Washington Capitals team comes into this game 6-3-1 and one in their last 10. It's been like an up and down year for them, but when this Capitals team is on and winning games, what drives them? What allows this group of players to be successful for the stretches where they are? 
Well, early in the season, Tyler, it was a lot of really good defensive structure. And his first year coach, Spencer Carberry, came in and said, basically, we want to play fast. And then realized he had a really old team. So he went to, we really need to defend well. And they became a really good defensively structured team. And they got really good goaltending from Charlie Lindgren and good enough goaltending from Darcy Kemper. And then things kind of went off the rails a little bit. Alex Ovechkin got hurt. He wasn't scoring goals. Coming out of the All-Star break, they're scoring goals. Alex goes from eight, eight in the season to 17 real quick. And all of a sudden, Pucks were going to the net, and there was a concerted effort to take more shots, put more rubber on net, crash the net. And, and, and for a team that was one of the worst offensive or production teams in the league for the first half of the year, they're scoring goals again. And because of that, they're in the race, maybe on the fringe of the race in these, but they're in it. Yeah, I mean, they they are. And when a team like Detroit is starting to slip the, the way that they are, it opens everything up. You look, the Islanders are playing great hockey right now. The Lightning, I mean... They feel like a team that should be able to flip the switch, but you never know. Then obviously Detroit, Washington, Buffalo now working their way into it. When you look at this, if you had to, I guess, handicap it, who do you think gets in? Whose game do you like the most here in the final 16, 17 games of the season? Hey, I'm with you. I, th I think the I think the, the the Lightning are a team that should be in the playoffs, and the Islanders are playing like a team that belongs in the playoffs. But I, I really I, I'd love to answer this at the end of this Capitals five game road trip. Uh, after the Oilers, they play the Kraken, they play the or they play uh, the Flames, they play the Canucks, and, and this is a brutal stretch of schedule that includes them coming home and playing the Leafs and the Hurricanes and the Jets. And so it's a brutal stretch. And because of the schedule alone, I don't think it's the Capitals. But Brian McClellan said at the deadline and around it is the reason why he didn't trade away Charlie Lindgren and Nick Dowd for spare parts was, look, as if a team in front of the Capitals falters, they have a chance to kind of pick up the pieces. And, and it's, I mean, I do horse racing a lot. There are a lot of horse trainers who send their horses into race saying, if the favorite doesn't have it, we our horse has a chance to win. And that's where the Capitals are right now. I think they have they have three spots they could chase, and that's the, the Lightning and, and, and the Red Wings in the wild card spots, but also the Flyers in, in that third spot in the Metropolitan Division that the Islanders are coming after. But it's hard not to like the job that Patrick Waugh has done with the New York Islanders since taking over. You take a, a great goalie like Ilya Sorokin, a great coach like Patrick Waugh, and, and you kind of fix some of the things that were wrong with the Islanders, and it feels like they're going to be playing into late April, if not May. You mentioned that Washington, obviously, the, the core is old and for this team, but what's this next generation of Washington Capitals look like? Like yesterday, Ovechkin, I, maybe it was a bit of a joke, but he mentioned uh, Connor McMichael as one of the guys and, and Lapierre. Like, what, what are they looking like a couple of years from now, do you think? Liam, that's interesting because, yeah, yeah, there was a hilarious line by Alex Ovechkin mentioning Connor McMichael and, and Hendricks LaPierre. But also, those are the guys who are probably going to be maybe not the, the next line of stars for this team, but certainly the complementary players. They drafted Ryan Leonard out, out of Boston College with mm -hmm. the eighth overall pick. They think he's going to be a potential star. Uh, Ivan Mirosnyshenko was their first round pick the previous year. He's with the team now, uh, probably going to play a lot in the AHL, a long Calder Cup playoff run this spring. They think he's a big part of it. And I think the guys who are going to be maybe their best players three, four years down the line, we don't know who they are yet. And, 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 if McMichael and or, and or LaPierre turn into real players, if Rasmus Sandin continues his progress, he's part of that core. Martin Farivari is part of it. You're starting to see a little bit of, of kind of what who their second and third line guys should be and who their second and third pairing guys should be. But uh, they're thinking and hoping that Ryan Leonard is one winds up becoming the star while Tom Wilson, who was signed for eternity and is going to be the captain when Alex Ovechkin retires, is the face of the franchise. Mm -hmm. Just looking at Alex Ovechkin's season here, it you know, kind of is becoming a lock. It's not going to be a 40 goal oh, season for him. Uh, after after doing that, plus for the last sure. couple. Um, but when you look at what Ovechkin's been like this season, we know the slumps from earlier. Was any of that just bad luck, or did we finally see a sizable step back in his game? Well, Tyler, I think it's a few things. A, the first half of the year, he looked like a 38-year-old hockey player. And we know in this sport that guys very rarely age gracefully. That it goes all You, you kind of lose it all at once and fall off a cliff. And I, we were starting to see that with Alex Ovechkin, but all the puck luck was going against him in the first half of the year. And, and goals, his expected goals were, were just not a lot higher, not 40-goal season higher, but 20, 25-goal season uh, higher, which is now the pace he's on uh, and, and kind of in line to, to maybe catch Wayne Gretzky's record. I'd say probably a 50-50 chance at this point. But uh, three things happened. He he changed his stick at, at the All-Star break. He got a chance to, to get away and see his family in Dubai at the All-Star break, and his kids are with him now. And he's getting those bounces he wasn't getting in the first half of the year. And, and, and you take those three things and put them together, and, and it adds up to what's more reasonably a, a really a pretty good scoring season for a guy who's 38 and is going to turn 39 years old in September. 
I know we've been bouncing around a little bit here from the current events of the Capitals and what they could look like down the road. But when you look, a team like Pittsburgh, they're, they're so lost. It, does, it feels like they have no direction at all. What direction do you think the Capitals go in this summer with this group? Do they just continue to buy into the future and maybe sell off some of those pieces, lingering Dowd, guys with term, maybe even a Nick Jensen? Do they push more to the future? Or is this a front office that you think is going to want to try and stay somewhat competitive heading into next season? Well, I'll take a quick victory lap and say I had the Penguins missing the playoffs back in September. So I'm going to say that first. Uh, I, I was pretty early on. The Penguins are old and slow, and 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 the goaltending was a mess there. But I, what Brian McClellan's job is is not simple, but he's in an interesting spot that he wants to keep Alex Ovechkin happy, and he needs to keep this team good enough to give Ovechkin a chance at, at breaking this record and, and being able to score enough goals to do that. I think it's kind of tweaking on sort of the edges and the margins of this team where they, they, they went out and got Sonny Milano and Dylan Strom a couple off seasons ago, players in their, in their early to mid twenties, other teams didn't want someone like a Trevor Zegers on the trade market this summer. I could see being a, a target, a Jacob Chikrin is someone with the capitals that have been interested in for a long time of trying to get players in a certain age range to where you're not going into a full scale rebuild because Al Sovech can still sign for two more years at two more seasons after this one, but they're also not going to go selling off Connor McMichael and Hendricks LaPierre in their first round pick. It, it's sort of a almost retooling on the fly. And I, I hate that term. Sometimes it's overused in hockey, but they're, they're doing something where they want to continue contending. They're probably, not going to win a championship again in the Alex Ovechkin era, but playing meaningful games and giving young a young team and young players chances to be in playoff races is certainly helpful. I say so. I think it's a little bit of they've got a lot of cap space to spend. Nick Backstrom be on LTIR this summer. They've got all that room. They've got Kuznetsov, who they basically got a third round pick from Carolina for, and only are going to count three point nine against the cap next year. I think Brian McClellan is going to be aggressive in the trade market this summer and trying to bring in players in a certain age range they want, while also using those draft picks to try to get the players that are going to be helping four or five years from now what have uh what have your thoughts been on darcy kemper as a washington capital it, you know we were kind of just talking that maybe it's not gone quite as planned from a guy who was oilers fans wanted him so desperately and now he has an 893 this season Oh, you guys were talking about Jack Campbell earlier, and, and those mm -hmm. guys got such similar contracts from the Oilers and Capitals. It's gone well, way better than Jack Campbell's gone for the Edmonton Oilers, that's for <laughs> sure. Um, and, and, but it, it, he's been okay, and, and, and this is nothing against Darcy Kemper, but he won a Stanley Cup behind a Colorado Avalanche team that scored a lot and defended really well. And I think he really would have fit well with the Toronto Maple Leafs with some tweaks there where it's a good team that could hold on to the puck enough that you don't need him to make the, the quantity of saves that the Capitals have needed him to make at certain points. And one of the big reasons the Capitals are in the race now is how good Charlie Lindgren has been. Uh, Darcy Kemper is obviously starting against the Oilers, uh, a chance for, for, for him to kind of rebound, rebound and find his game. But when the Capitals had must win games going into the trade deadline, Spencer Carberry uh, kept going back and back and back to Charlie Lindgren. It's pretty clear that Darcy Kemper has become the backup here, but it's not such a contract where they're worried about having to send him to the minors or buy him out. He's he's doing his job. He is he's making a, a nice paycheck, and, and he's a good guy to have in the room. Stephen Wino covers DC sports for the Associated Associated Press. Easy for me to say, but he does so much more. What's next? You got a maybe a story coming out on Aaron Rodgers and the vice presidency, or what? <laughs> I, I, I wish I had that. I, I actually need to go talk to Leonard Hamilton at Florida State. He, he just got their game done here. But no, I, the Ted Cruz thing was it was enough yesterday on, on college athletics. I'm going to stay away from politics and, and RFK and Aaron and Aaron Rodgers here. Uh, you're the man, Stephen Wino. Thanks for doing this, buddy. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon. There See you ya. go, Stephen Wino on the Star Mechanical guest line. Uh, Sean is in. How fast can he say Associated Press? Well, I can't say it very fast at all, but uh, Steve's in, Stephen is a great guy. He's a great guy, and we got a lot of info there in, what, a 10-minute segment with our pal from the Associated Press, so that was a lot of fun. Shout out to Star Mechanical, starmechanical.ca. Uh, Liam, we didn't get into it there with Wino, but I did have a uh, great clips inbox question that I wanted to float your way just about the Washington Capitals a little bit. All Shout right. out to Great Clips with more than 4,400 hair salons throughout the United States and Canada. Great Clips is the world's largest hair salon brand and official hair salon of the NHL. They're locally owned and operated open seven days a week, and your time's valuable, which is why you can take advantage of the Great Clips check-in app. You see the wait time, you check in on your phone, you get your haircut when you want it. For more information, check out greatclips.com. Great Clips, it's gonna be Great. If you were the GM of the Washington Capitals, Liam, what direction would you go this summer? Would you sell off some future assets to try to get a piece 
maybe like a Trevor Zegris or another young player available somewhere? Or do you push in, buy into the draft, and maybe sell off some Nick Jensen's and Nick Dowd's to get some future assets and maybe hit big on a first rounder? I would continue with the philosophy they have right now. So I, I maybe I would pursue someone like a, a Trevor Zegris. I think you look through their, their draft capital. They've got quite a few second round picks over the next couple of years. So maybe they can sacrifice a first, maybe not this year, but the year after. But look, like this team's only two or three points out of a playoff spot with an aging core. But yeah. like Steven said, like they've got some good secondary pieces. Like, I think that's the difference between them and the Pittsburgh Penguins. Guys like Strom and Sonny Milano like, are still solid players and contributing to this team. And the loss of Backstrom was big, but also maybe like a blessing in disguise because now Lapierre and Connor McMichael can have a full year as top six sentiment and just let it ride and see what happens. So I, I would keep pushing for them for this season. And I wouldn't go all in like Pittsburgh did getting Carlson and stuff. I think that can be a real lesson for Washington of what not to do with your star player, aging star players. So I still like that group. That goaltending is going to be iffy. Like Charlie Lindgren, how much better is he going to get? Like it's likely he gets probably a little bit worse and you just kind of hope Darcy Kemper can, can pick it up a little bit and there can be some balance there. But I would, uh, I would pursue some, some younger talent in the Zegers age group. I you think agree? that's the play. Yeah, I think that's the play as well. I really I'm happy Wino brought up Ryan Leonard. I forgot about him. He could be a he's real so good, good player for them. Like he's he's nasty. So if you tack on another, you know, top 15, top 12 pick this year into the system, you know, maybe this summer, yeah, you take a look at a spare couple of picks and see if you can flip it into a decent piece of young talent to add to this roster. But if not, I think they have a chance to kind of stay competitive, keep making good middle-ish round picks and then middle-ish first round picks yeah. i'd say early slash middle first round picks and go from there so there you go there is our uh question for great clips let's get back to the hockey game tonight liam and go to our keys to victory brought to you by sherwood power sports and marine it will be the exclusive spot in sherwood park for all things yamaha including yamaha boats boat motors dirt bikes atv side by sides and motorcycles check them out now out in sherwood park sherwood power sports and marine the sleek all black exterior and just like with sherwood for the giant with Sherwood Power Sports and Marine, you are going to get a tremendous service department. Getting the vehicle, getting the boat, getting your ATV, that is just the first step. Keeping it running smoothly, that is what our friends at Sherwood Ford the Giant and Sherwood Power Sports and Marine do best. Keys to victory, Liam. I will go first. Power play. The Oilers' power play needs to get going. So far in the month of March, they've played six times, and the Oilers' power play is just 5.9%. That pains me. That hurts. They need to be better with the man advantage. I need to see in the final, you know, 25% of this regular season here, 20% of the regular season, whatever we're at now. I want to see this top unit start to build up some momentum and start to look elite. And tonight, I'm looking for them to do that. Power play, take us to victory. Yeah, it does need to does need to pick it up a little bit here and just get find that rhythm again down the stretch. My key to victory, what will I go with? I mean, I think a good one would be to show a little bit of speed against this Washington team. Like yeah. we said, like they're an aging group. So I'll go with that. But I, I'm actually going to go with staying consistent, I think, is a good one. I think over this last little stretch here, the last three games, I would say, I think they were pretty good against Boston for 60 minutes. But they struggled to find their game for much of the Columbus, Buffalo, and even Pittsburgh games. So... I'll say stay consistent throughout. That doesn't mean play a full 60 because that's difficult to do in the NHL, but don't lose your game so much. Yeah, I think that is uh, that is fair. One player I want to talk about who I'll say is maybe a secondary key to victory is Adam Henrique. And we've now gotten a couple of games or three games with him as an Edmonton Oiler. And I want to get to a little quote he had. Sounds of the Oil presented by Snow Valley Aerial Park and Rainbow Valley Campground opening May 31st family fun all summer long out at Snow Valley. And if you're looking to come into the city, do a little bit of camping right in the heart of Edmonton. The Rainbow Valley Campground has you covered. Rainbow-Valley.com. Adam Henrique the other day, quote, it's just a matter of settling in and finding some chemistry with guys and hopefully building off that. We've kind of, he's been fine. He hasn't jumped in and been this like, wow, major impactful piece. Like I remember the first couple games with Matias Ekholm, it was like, Holy shit, this guy is so yeah. good. 
I haven't seen that yet with Henrique. So if I had to put a letter grade on how Henrique has looked so far with the Oilers, I'd probably go with like a C plus. And I understand that might be a little harsh and I'm not even like angry about his play. It, I think it's hard to fit in. One thing I will say, I want to see Chris Knobloch staple him with consistent line mates for a couple of games here. And he did do that over the weekend, but staple him with consistent line mates. And like Henrique said, in Sounds of the Oil, try to build some chemistry. But what have you thought of Henrique? Yeah, I think he's been fine. I don't think he's done too much to do anything, but I haven't noticed him make mistakes either, which is a positive. And I think one thing he's done indirectly is allow Ryan McLeod to go up the lineup, which has been fantastic. So I think that's a bonus of ha having Adam Henrique as your lineup is it makes your top six better by allowing McLeod to play there. So we need yep. to see a little bit more, but also it's been three games and he's been on the road for three games. Like they're at home tonight. Let's see what he's got. Uh, the Canada at Henrique and Brown are going to be the Shaq and Kobe meme by the end of the year. I, you know what? It's good to have dreams. That's what I'll say to you, Canada. Uh, figured squishy says figured it'd be three to five games before Henrique clicks. Lance isn't worried. He says Henrique will come around. Daki is calling a Henrique goal tonight. Actually, I haven't disliked that third line at all. And Naeem says you made a good point. If that second line can be kept together, it's all worth it, Liam. Yeah, and I think that's what he was brought in for, right? Like, to yep. add that depth into the lineup. And I get it. Like, I mean, and I know he made a comment yesterday. He made a comment today. He's like, he hasn't done anything. And I think that's fair to say, too. But let's give this guy some time here. And I I don't know if I'm on the boat of uh, Henrik and Brown chemistry coming around. People may not remember this, but Henrik and McDavid also played junior together. And that has not worked out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I would love to see them click in that third line be good for, for the oil, but I don't know. Uh, it is Wednesday. People are saying, where's Frank? He is on vacation on a very sunny beach, living it up in the sun. Although I did hear he ran into our friend Chris Pronger the other day. Um, so that's funny. Anyways, Frank's not on the show this week because he is taking some uh, well-earned vacation. Let's get into it is Wednesday. It's time for Liam's game. We didn't have a chance to do it last week because we were all caught up with deadline stuff, Liam. But let's get into it. NationGear.ca, the latest Robin Brownlee auction is up right now. And here's what we got going on for you this week. It is a day with our friends at Sports 1440. You get to tour the studio, meet the crew, including Gregor and Carius. You get to watch shows live in studio. And Sports 1440 wants to send you and a friend to the game on March 21st as well. So right now, the bidding's only at 250 bucks. You get to go meet Gregor, maybe even see what kind of guests they got in studio that day. They Ooh. always have great guests. And you're getting two tickets to the game for you and a friend as well. And it's all going to a great cause as we support Robin Brownlee's family. We help his boy Sam, you know, a little bit of money for him to go to college and things like that. Funeral costs, all those burdens that come with it. Uh, so we're happy to support the Brownlee family. And we would love to have you support him with the auction. Again, 250 bucks right now is the next bid up. And you're getting two tickets to the game. Gregor interviewed Vinny yesterday. That's yeah. pretty sweet. Uh, Liam's game. If you don't know how it works, we got 25 bucks to Nation Gear up for grabs. We have an easy player and then a difficult player. If you're the first player or you're the first person in the YouTube chat to get the easy player correct, you're entered into a draw. If you are one of the three people, first three people to get the difficult player, you're also in that draw. Four names go in. One name gets 25 bucks to Nation Gear. Liam, let's go. All right. Flash up the easy one, Aaron. Okay, I'm a former first round pick. I am a forward. I have played a thousand games in my career. I played seven seasons in Edmonton, and I have played for three NHL teams. Any guesses? Oh, Mulet got it before you were even done reading the clues, and I think I got it too, no, Liam. He wasn't the first one, though. He wasn't? No. Uh oh. Ooh, okay. We got a toss up here because he said it, but Isaac Chow spelled it wrong and then corrected himself. But he had the first one in. But he put Jordan Beadle. <laughs> Auto the, answer is Jordan Eberle. Uh, the answer is Jordan Everly. Shout out to everyone who's getting it right now, pouring into the chat. Can we put both Isaac and Mulek in the draw? Yeah, I'll put them I both think that's in. fair. I think that's right. fair. We'll, we'll we'll split the tie. Mulek, the Beetle boy. All right. Uh, <laughs> that one was very easy. And I recognize that. But I, it's been a couple of weeks. So I wanted to throw it. Throw a little fastball right down the middle for everybody. A little warm up, a little warm up. All right. Okay. So there you go. That was our warm up. Jordan Eberly is mystery player number one. Player number two in Liam's game. Give me them clues. Here we go. 
I played just over 700 games in the NHL. I finished my career in Europe. I only played one year in Edmonton. I played for six different NHL teams in 10 years. Five of those teams were over a three-year span. Five of those teams were over a three-year span. Okay, I just had a random player pop into my head. Oh, no, he didn't play 700 games. Hey, guys, no one guessed Jim Vandermeer. It was not Jim Vandermeer. <laughs> no, not Jim Vandermeer. Not Tyler Ennis. Yeah, I think he played a couple of years in Edmonton. Yeah, not uh, Cam Parker. He didn't play 700 games. Did you? No one's guessed it yet, I don't think. No, no one's got it yet. Adam Oates, no. Yaga never played for Edmonton. Just a heads up for everyone. Uh, um, guys, Curtis Foster, not him. Although Curtis Foster looks like he could be Colby Cohen's dad. Um, oh, man, I'm struggling right now. This is a uh, tough one. Yeah, I know. That's. I kind of thought I would have to dig a little bit more for this one. Not Landa. There's a big clue I could give. I'll give you one clue. He was a forward. Has anyone gotten it? No, no one. There's been a ton of guesses. Yes, he, <laughs> you see Jokinen was a funny guess. No, I haven't thought of that guy for a long time, though. No, you got to remember that. And it's a forward, you said, hey? You got to remember yes. the 700 game thing. Like, that. that's so, tough. And then so to the, finish your career in Europe, too. Like, Yeah, and I'll give you a couple of clues. He probably shouldn't have finished his year in Europe. And so the last clue, I think, is a good one. He played for five teams over the last three years. So he played for one team for most of his career. And in the last three years, just kind of was traded a few times. Hmm. Traded a bunch of times right at the end of his year. Hey, people, it's an oiler. It is an oiler. Um, it's not Ryan Callahan. No. Um, <laughs> Kyle Turris didn't finish his career in Ed or in Europe. Brendan Perlini didn't play 700 games in the NHL. I can promise you that. Um, I can't like, has no one really gotten it yet? No one has guessed it. I don't, I haven't seen it once. Okay. Edmonton was the last team he played for before he went to Europe. <sighs> Ryan Jones didn't play, obviously play on enough teams. So it couldn't have been him. A lot yeah, of people, and you said it's not Ennis, right? No, it's not Ennis. However, he was teammates with Tyler Ennis at one of his teams. So there's another clue. <laughs> there's another clue. Yeah, Ennis. I mean, he fits a decent amount of this description, though. Yeah, but he played no. two years in Edmonton, so, so it wouldn't be him. So he was teammates with Ennis at one point. Um, Like, it's not chase on because okay. he didn't go to Europe we're gonna keep moving I'll, I'll drop another clue he had great chemistry with someone on new oilers during his short stint here <laughs> okay on, we got I one heard. one person I got, got it. it i know who it is you you, you that gave it away that gave I it know. away that was taking too long you see but it is, nobody else is, okay we got two in two in uh ml ye 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 20. Yeah, got that one. ML. Yeah, ML. And who's the next one? Uh, uh oh, I think it was. Mm, I don't want to mess this up. I think it was uh wise Kyle. Yeah, I think so too. All right, there you okay. go. We got, we got five names in the draw. That took way longer than expected for Liam's game. I know. Uh, it was Derek Roy for people who couldn't figure yeah, that one out. It was Derek Roy. Hold on, my bloody thing. Scott Aroni, you went too easy, then you went too hard, Liam. I didn't think that would be that crazy. Yeah, uh, but okay. when when the clues are that vague sometimes and they can apply to that many people, it's hard to like narrow it down. I thought the one season in Edmonton was going to be... I should have made it like his last season. But anyway, okay, here we go. So we've got Yee Yee, Tyler Mulek... Isaac Chow, Wise Kyle, and ML in the in the thing. Mm -hmm. It was spinning. Da -da -da -da. M L. You ML. are the winner. You're the winner. Email me Tyler at the Nation Network dot com. Tyler at the Nation Network dot com and just say I'm ML. 
I have won Liam's game. I would like $25 to Nation Gear, and I will get you hooked up with that GC. Go to nationgear.ca now if you want to get in on that Robin Brownlee auction as well. Uh, let's keep cruising along with today's show. The menu mm-hmm. for our friends at DoorDash, 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first on your first order of $15 or more. All you need to do is download the DoorDash app and enter the promo code NATION25. Dash that for the win with DoorDash. You can even use the double dash feature. It allows you to add a second stop onto your DoorDash order for no extra delivery fees. Bagged Milk's dropping a cereal-themed edition of BLTN. If you're a fan of hockey talk and nonsense, I'll say, in, in the way that real life also has nonsense. Bag Milk talks about a lot of real life stuff on his pod. So check out Better Late Than Never. Late is L-A-I-T, like milk. Uh, also, pre-gaming, 7 o'clock tonight with myself and Aaron Bordato. And then after dark, immediately following the final buzzer tonight. So lots of stuff going on here on the Oilers Nation YouTube. Uh, Liam, Wendy's Daily Faceoff Survivor Game. We're both out. Yeah, I had Dallas over three and a half goals. Yeah, me too. I had that one and I busted. So very upset about that. Uh, Let's wrap up the show with our Betway game day betting challenge, though. Uh, Let's flash up that board. See what we're betting on. Courtesy of our friends at Betway 19 plus. Please play it responsibly this evening and all evenings, I suppose. Liam still in the lead plus 5.36 units. I'm down 8.39. Jay's in the negatives as well. I'm taking one that I think is a nice little layup. Oilers puck line minus 120. Not overthinking it. Give me the puck line. Oilers should win. They are dominant, dominant on home ice. 28 and two, the Capitals sub 500 on the road. So let's go. Liam, what do you got? I think I should just get rid of the records on this and just put the units because I cannot count apparently, but I have a Warren Fogel goal plus 300 playing on the second line with dry sidle. I'll take it any day of the week. Yeah, I think you should because none of this makes sense. How have you done 37 know. bets. I've only done 33 and Jay's done 35. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you question, are the units even right? Only God knows. And hopefully Lance Kane has finished counting. <laughs> uh, that is a, uh, there you go. That's the challenge. Jay's taking a Henrik goal at 3.75 to one. So uh, that's a bold one. I think I got the safest bet, but that is that strategy has not worked for me so far this year. But Who knows? Maybe I can go on a little bit of a late season heater and get myself back in the mix here, as I always like to say. Shout out to Batway 19 Plus. Please play responsibly. People confused by the math. Again, we never promise to be a professionally run show. Hunter says if Fogel scores, I'm shaving my head. Hunter, terrible bet to make. Awful bet to make. Come back tomorrow, Hunter, with a shaved head in that profile picture. Hopefully it's not Hunter the Lynx. (laughs) That'd be funny. Maybe it is. Uh, there you go. Uh, oh, Aaron wanted on the heels of my It's Always Sunny reference, Bag Milk dropped a Tyler acronym in the chat. So Aaron did a Photoshop he wanted us to show. Tyler, trust, yearning, love, energy. What does that say? Rec- Reckon- Rec- Rec- reconnaissance? Mm-hmm. Yep. Assets? Reconnaissance? Something like that. Um, I would like to bring up Noah's comment if this is an appropriate time. Yep, do it up, do it up. So Noah brought up a tweet at us to bring our power tools today, despite us being at home. Probably shouldn't have asked people to do that yesterday. And he said, Can you guys talk about the no goal in the no call in the Vegas game yesterday? I tweeted you about if you guys saw that. Uh it looked like it was uh maybe a hold on Jack uh sorry, Bjorkstrand on the Ico goal. I don't think it was. I think Bjorkstrand kind of got himself tangled up and Carlson, if they showed a different angle, was trying to get out of the way a little bit. So I'm not on that train. What I will say was Seattle don't blow a two goal lead in the last like seven minutes of a game. Yeah. Um, also, big shout out to him for reminding me about the power tools, but I'm not going into the office today. So it really doesn't matter all that much. Uh, Hunter was in and says, are you kidding me? That's the one comment that gets picked. Yeah, that's a really <laughs> tough break for you. Mainlander Tim Hunter continuing the Owen everyday tradition of making bets with no upside. Hunter, if you were smart, you would go put $100 on Fogel to score any time today. Mm-hmm. Um, just because then at least if you have to shave your head, you'll have 400 bucks in your jeans at the end of the night. So uh, there you go. Bob says, great episode. Well, you, well, the internet stunk or YouTube stunk. Not even the internet. YouTube just randomly decided to shit its pants for the first four minutes of or 10 minutes of today's show. Someone said, Tyler, you love the ending of that game. Damn right. <laughs> The race is on, though, still in the West. I still believe. I ah, still sure. believe. 
Sure. Minnesota won. Sure. Minnesota won last night. Shout out to the song Cold Like Minnesota by Lil Yachty. Yep. Shout out Lil Yachty. Lil. It's not. There's no T. Shout out Little Yachty, Little Baby, and <laughs> Little Wayne. Uh, Mulek says, great to be back. Been busy recently and missing lots. Tyler Mulek, I was wondering if you were dead. Time change. Time yeah, change. Yeah. All right. Uh, yes, for the people asking, I will be at the game tonight. So if you see me, say, hey, Tyler, how's it going? Then don't say anything else. I have, very poor, I have very poor social skills in those situations, and I never – literally, people come up and be like, hey, Tyler, I, I like I watch the show, and I my only response is usually like, it's a decent first period, and then I just walk away. I say, thanks for watching, then I run away screaming with my hands waving in the air. <laughs> Uh, Liam's going to be at the game tonight, too, everybody. So uh, look out for him. Uh, that is a wrap on today's edition of the show. A short for giant game day edition of the show. A big, big shout out to our guy, Stephen Wino, for swinging by on the Star Mechanical guest line. Aaron Bordado producing the hell out of it. Watch him tonight at 7 on pre-gaming. And enjoy the hockey game tonight, everybody. We'll see you again tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you for watching Oilers Nation every day. Hit the subscribe button to never miss a show. And for more, visit OilersNation.com.